Ready? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Well, tonight, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about uh, identity. The reason we're going to talk about identity is because we have to look at the things that are happening around us and first, are they real? Like, if you look out in the yard and you see, are those real uh, cars out there? Uh, if you look at our property, is it real that um, holes were punched in our property? Uh, if you look at our cars in the past, is it real that someone uh, been sabotaging our cars for decades? Is that real? Okay, if we look at um, things that happen with our bank account in the social arena, are, are these things that are real, are they really happening? And if they're really happening, what does it all mean? You know, like uh, how long has it been happening? How regular, how constant have they been happening? And then it would lead to the question as well, is someone or some community a target? Are they a target? If they're a target, how long have they been a target? Been 10 years, 15 years? Could it been 50 years? Could someone actually be a target for 50 years? Is that possible? If they are a target, then the people that join the other team, what would be the benefits of them joining the other team? Would they get uh, certain benefits? Uh, how would a target be treated? You know, uh, how long would they be treated like that? How would we know their target? You know, what would be the purpose of their targetism if they're a real target? If we research and if we study our recent history uh, and history in general, what would be the purpose of all of this? If, if we discovered that this has really been happening, it's really, really going on. I mean, it's not the figment of a, an imagination. It's not paranoia because they are like stacks of books and records and dates that all fit you know what I mean? And uh, 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 the thing has been gone over, I don't know, not hundreds of times, but sometime even more than that, over and over again. But what, for what reason? You know, uh, we talk about delay a lot here. And uh, personally, I was gonna go back to California and early January, so I could go to court on the, uh, on the 6th of January. Then uh, our brother, Suleimani, was assassinated. And this was a major global event. To everybody else, they could say what they want. But to us, it was a major global event. All of the things that we had been talking about, why are these people going here by the millions? Why is this happening? What is a strategic alliance? How long has it been going on? What does it mean? Uh, the, the war in Yemen, how does it fit? Saudi Arabia and its history, Iran and its background and struggle, Syria and its global position, why is this? Why, is, why are all of these things important? And when Aga Suleimani was assassinated, to other people, it might not have been no big thing, but to us, you can remember, ah, this is exactly, it took it at least an hour for it to all fall together. Wait a minute, that just happened then that means one, two, three. We wasted no time. Our kutbas and our focus and our attitude was all on certain specifics. It was clear. Okay, 
So we still will we'll, we'll just cruise along. I, I want us to think about delay for a little bit and uh, whether it's personal delay or whether it's um, intervene delay. Whether our lives are delaying you, whether the society is delaying you, whether it's in environmental circumstances, but it all adds up to delay. Something is holding things back for a minute because we're not going back to California right away. Then we did the lecture on China. Uh, and, and on China, we put uh, China, Japan, the whole Asian society together, and we said that this is your century. Now this is how you should behave. <laughs> it, you know, I could imagine if somebody's listening to that and they say, how is the Negro gonna put all of that stuff together and it means something anyway? What is he talking about? In that, we also mentioned something though. We mentioned that in, this me in the meantime, this was still in January, early January, and we said that we hope that China can develop a, a salve, a bomb, or uh, uh, some defense, right? S virus defense against the, the uh, to help support the Negro. These, are th this, this things was exactly said. The Chinese should gonna automatically look out for themselves. But we were saying, and we hope that they blend in a little. Just to think about the Negro on the side. Uh, this uh, environment, uh, uh, coronavirus and all that wasn't as big as it is now, but it was on the way. And we felt it right then. We felt it all the time. We felt it the first time we heard about it back in it might have been November or it could have been December. Okay. But it was on our mind. Now, this thing about um, identity, we, we used to talk about a period of wandering in the wilderness, you know, during the early years. Well, uh, this might be a period of uh, petite wandering in the wilderness, small, not wandering in the wilderness. Wandering in the wilderness is you're really figuring out deep things and what your part is and uh, what you're going to play in that part, which way is the world. You're doing a lot of big time analysis. And it's over a long period of time. It's not a few months or one year or something. It may be over a long period of time, you know. Uh, it, it'll go through different stages, but it's still a long evolution. It's a protracted wilderness. It's not a instant wilderness where you go in, you get lost, and you find your way and you come out. Because during these periods, there's a lot of research, analysis, and projection going on. This is a deep period because you're not looking at yourself only, you're looking at yourself, but you're looking at the world. You're looking at the part you're gonna play in this or what part would you play in it? And if you played that part, how would that be? These are all very serious things. In Petite Wandering in the Wilderness, you might have uh, come to some conclusions say a few months ago, and you had talked about things like write your own book, uh, write yourself into that book, and write your own history, and then write other people into that. And at that time, all of that makes perfect sense. But there are small changes. The two things that have happened in recent months have been big. 
Every, this is the earth, what happened uh, with uh, Dr. Suleimani was big. It brought out a whole feeling of revolution in a people. It, they was in the street like they was at the beginning of the revolution. Why? Because they was getting ready to go to a period that was just like that, except even bigger. Why? Because they're getting ready to get hit by this coronavirus and they're not gonna get any mercy, any kindness. They're not gonna, they can have the whole world crying out, hey man, let, let the stuff slide. I mean, the whole, this is what the whole world is saying. Hey man, why you got still got the stuff on your hand? The people is dying. It can't be because you just don't like, uh, you know what I mean, the government. That's the people dying. That's not the government dying. You don't see no relief. Okay. Therefore, they're being made, uh, now they're coming through it fine. In fact, a few things that we was going to say about uh, them and that situation, we're keeping our mouths shut. Why? Because we don't want to get confused with a bunch of idiots that's making this complaint and that complaint. Why? Because this is a great period of history. Okay? They're going through that period. And that period that they're going through is uh, a history uh, based in a certain type of revival. And Allah gave them the spirit that they needed exactly at this time. This is why uh, there were certain things that happened to them. Uh, this is why uh, Aga Suleimani was assassinated. And then the brother from Iraq was assassinated with him. That was for all kind of reasons, to unify those two uh, countries, those two peoples, and solidify them. Then when you look around the world, you have to figure out now, what's happening with us is this. Okay, these are little changes here. They are real changes. When I said the other day that, uh, yeah, I just heard that uh, two days ago, maybe three at the most, yeah, two days ago, I just heard that the Negro was dying like flies and this, uh, you heard that recently? Yeah, okay. So, hmm, okay. Well, let's get back on. Let's for sure have this thing uh, like last night. I hold it. Temporary stall. For what reason? Allah knows best. But let's just hold up a second. It's a delay. This is an environmental delay. This is not you sitting down and uh, saying, I'm going to delay this. But it's happening anyway. Then they came out with the second punch. Oh, Latinos are dying too at a high rate. So is blacks. I don't know if you heard that part. And Latinos. Other people would say, this is terrible. It's not terrible. It's, it's just right. It's not the death and everything. But the two peoples. See, a lot of people don't remember during the civil rights struggle that was uh, blacks and then that was brown berets. Like uh, in California, they call, Mexicans call themselves from that period Chicanos, not Mexicanos. Now, when you're all in the news, you see uh, Mexican, 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 Mexicanos. But in California, the original Mexicans that was in California, that we grew up with, was they are almost carbon copies of Negroes, and Negroes are carbon copies of them. They used to wear 
French toes, and we used to wear knobs. French toes is a type of a shoe. And knobs is like, uh, they could be Stacy Adams, or they could be Conley's, but they, they have a certain shape on the toe. That's why we call them knobs. Blacks would have a sport coat and khakis pressed in iron, and, Nick, and uh, Mexicans would have counties pressed in iron, and the sport coat would be flapped right over. It would be almost perfect. And that's what, they lived like that. And so, that was a period when in 1968 and other periods, Mexicans or Chicanos had big demonstrations in LA and places like that. So they went through a, a, a revival themselves and that revival has still been going on amongst them. In the meantime, in the last 50 years, millions of Mexicans have came here from Mexico. Okay, the flavor changed a little bit. In East LA and all those places, uh, in the 40s and all those years, Mexicans and blacks wore zoot suits, you know, like Malcolm them. Zoot suits, big shoulder pads, suits, big chain. Yeah, Mexicans and blacks. You see low riders, them low cars with juice. Low riders was a club, a black club in LA way back when. They called them low riders. Uh, Mexicans that have their cars juiced up and all of that, we have a very close culture. Now, the Latinos that have come here in the last 50 years are not as tied to that. The other historical realities are if you was here in DC, 20, 25, 30 years ago, the main subject was teen pregnancy. Amongst black kids, teen pregnancy. Guess what? You don't hear about that anymore. What happened? Why? Where did they go? Did they stop having whatever they do? They haven't stopped doing that. Well, what happened? That means something has interfered with the birth process. In the meantime, in California, you could see, we mentioned it on talks, you could see a young Latino girl, let's say Mexican for California, with a baby in a, tum a, a, baby in a tummy, one on each side, <coughs> and sometimes <coughs> one in the cradle, pushing it. <coughs> so, but all of a sudden, the population in the last, just the last couple of years, see, you got to remember the population is very, in the year 2000, 20 years ago, they said blacks were 39 million and Latinos were 39 million. What a just a little. Since then, white population have continued to decline. Black population have continued to escalate a little, but there's been an explosion with Latinos. They have had a population explosion. To hear yesterday, and I'll pick up, to hear yesterday that, well, they had uh, blacks were being hit by this coronavirus and so are Latinos in huge numbers. That was just yesterday's news and day before yesterday's news. Now, 
the only way that this could be digested by blacks and Latinos is if they just took a stupid pill. Right? If coronavirus, well, okay, a virus here, a virus there, you have to go back. Who has a history? Who has a history of destroying populations? We've talked a thousand times about Indians being put on reservations, smallpox in their, on, on, in their, uh, uh, in their blankets that they gave them, the government gave them, okay? alcohol, all on reservations, all the things that destroy, sending the kids to these white schools and making it illegal for them to speak their native language, all of that, all of that went on in America, like it did in Australia and other colonial places, where the colonial power made his language, the lingua franca, do you know in Algeria, and uh, <coughs> they outlawed uh, Arabic as the official language and made French the main language. When I went to Algeria in the 70s, I told the brothers, hey, you know, we was in exile in Algeria. I said, teach me your language. You know what they said? Ah, learn French. They had to import teachers from Egypt and other Arab countries to Algeria to teach them standard Arabic, real Arabic, because the French had so insinuated themselves after 100 years into their society that they spoke a broken French, I mean a broken Arabic, uh, Amiya they call it, uh, you know. This is what they spoke. Okay, I'm gonna get back to the point. The point is, is that a lot of this stuff may seem disjointed. But a lot of times, it has a serious point. There's one thing that I want to talk about a little bit. Number one, identity. And we said, is this stuff real that's been happening to us? The next thing we wanted to talk about was our mission, Asabakun. Asabakun al Awalun min al Muhajirin wal Ansar wa Tabiin. Okay. Now, have we been living up to that title for the last 30 years, Asabakun? That means, have we been out in front of every issue. Have we stood up for every issue in America and in the Muslim world? Have we stood against the Zionists in Palestine? Have we stood against the Saudis' invasion of, of uh, Yemen, right? Have we stood for the uh, support of our people in Afghanistan and all over the Muslim world? Have we did that? If that's true, then we have really lived up to, as best we can, to Asabakun. Remember, Asabakun go out in front of everybody else. Asabakun don't wait for people to, uh, uh, the, Mufa, the, the Mufasas say, the ones that write the commentary, they said that the people originally the idea of Asabakun, because it says they lead the way, they show the way. Those are the people who accepted Islam before Badr. Badr was a big battle, you know, uh, about 18 months after the Hijra. The people that accepted Islam in those days accepted Islam for no other reason than La ilaha illallah, Muhammad an Rasulullah. That was it. In the Quran, you notice, you don't find in the, the Mecca surahs anything about munafiks. Why? Because <laughs> who's gonna accept Islam just to, to get punished, right? It's in Al-Medina, the Medina surahs 
talk about munafikin, nifak, and all of that, right? That's because at that time, that was something to gain. If you could pretend to be a Muslim and you would be a hypocrite, you might get up close to the Muslims and there might be some gain. Plus, you didn't have a battle to prove that Islam is here to stay. Okay. So, Asabakun is the name of our newsletter, it's the name of our organization, Asabakun. So, we have to think have we went out first? Have we acted in a premeditated way? Right? Have we planned and structured what we're trying to do so we could understand what's going on? anticipate it and then act according to that. And our research showed that we have done that. So if we've done that, if we have been the target of the system, there's no other masjid in DC or anywhere else in the United States that have been systematically cut off and isolated by the whole Muslim community. The whole Muslim community. That means if we invited people to speak here years ago from Dar al Hijra, uh, that means if they have something, then maybe they would invite us. They stop inviting us at a certain time. Out there at ICM, Islamic Center of Maryland, Gaithersburg, whatever it is, we should go out there every Friday and give a talk. When they had some problems out there between uh, Iqwanis trying to take over and the original Pakistani types and other African types that didn't want their center to be an Iqwani stronghold, they called us and we met the new, they, they wanted an intermediary, okay? then why nobody come to Masjid al-Islam? Is there any Masjid that if somebody comes here, they will follow those people and meet them at a grocery store and ask them, what Masjid do you go to, right? If you say, oh, I go to Masjid al-Islam, they'll say, oh, that's a Shia Masjid. Oh, that's an Afrocentric Masjid. Oh, they got a thousand things they'll say. But one thing is sure, those people won't come here again. They do that to everybody. The only people that come here are the ones that get the little stamp on their paycheck. That, like, that's who comes. That's okay. We've been knowing that for decades, and we had to, we'll go into it later, where we had to adjust and... and uh, Okay, now in this Islamic revival that we're dealing with right now, remember last week we talked, a, a few weeks ago, we talked about Ikamatul Deen, establishing the religion, and we talked about Islamic revival. What we meant at that time was, uh, Years ago, there was no need for an Islamic revival in America. Because the first thing we got to do is establish the deen. The deen has been established. Big masajid all over the United States. But are they living up to their, to their calling? Are they following what Allah say in Quran and Hadith? You see wrong, stop it with your hand. If you can't, speak out about it. If you can't, at least feel bad about it, and that's the weakest kind of faith. Where in America is there one sinner, one sinner that's jumping up and saying, hold it, we don't like what's going on in America. Instead, we find the Muslims voting. They're gonna vote in Barney Sanders or somebody, and they always choose the guy that lose. Yeah, they choose, they got mad at Bill Clinton or they got 
some kind of way in the early 2000s, they got George Bush in there and then they had supported uh, Bill Clinton or some, whoever it was, the old guy with the tall hair, the senator. Yeah, yeah, Kerry, Kerry, Kerry. They got on Kerry's side, then Bush won, and now they're sitting there looking stupid. I'm not going to go through that. We never went through that. We have never supported the American system because it's Zionist. The immigrant community supports the American system. They asked to come here. They, some of them pleaded to come here. And one of the lawyers, I spoke on a program in, in Dallas with one of the, a white lawyer, he's an immigration attorney. He said, half of all of my clients are asked by the FBI or immigration if they want to cooperate. So let's say half of them are asked, half of them cooperate. I mean, one fourth of the immigrant, because they, they're going to tell them, if you cooperated with us for a while, you know, your family that's back home, we'll let you bring them over here. And just imagine, that's great. All they got to do is cooperate with boss man. And remember, America always tramples on nationalism. America takes people from England and in a few years, they're fighting England for their freedom. They got Italians here, came from Italy, and they sent them right back to fight Mussolini. Hey, all of that nationalism stuff, it don't hold water here in America. America sucks people in from all over the world, then send them back to fight their own people. If you think I'm lying, go to any program. Any program with Isna, Ikna, guess who has a booth there? The United States government. And they're asking, they got all the flyers there. Those who are native speakers of Farsi, Pashto, right? Arabic, all those languages. And guess what? The table is full of people. Everybody's ass pulling it up. Why? They want a job to work for the United States government. And they want people to translate all the stuff that's being said all over the world. And they got tons of them here. Okay. Whether you call it Islam or not, here's what we have to do. We have decided that a long time ago on our policy here is nonviolent resistance. Alternative resistance. But if you listen to us speak now, you, you would never believe that our policy is a policy of love and kindness. It don't sound like that. At least to me, if I was out there, I don't think I would take this as a lecture on love and kindness, although <clears throat> we have practiced that with everybody we come in contact with. What is it? Love is a treatment for all the ills, all the great personalities, <clears throat> especially in religion, have came to that conclusion of forgiveness, kindness, and love, right? <clears throat> the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told the people, you be with the people you love, right? They said, we love Abu Bakr and Umar. He said, you're gonna be with the people you love, right? <clears throat> they said, well, well, I can't do what they do. They, they, they pray fast, all that. So you will be with the people you love. Love for Allah is a like a, well, you, it's taskiyabil nas. It's a purification of your nas. Love for Allah is a cleanliness. Is a everything in you know everything in Islam. All if we zakah, zakah it means zakat. It means purification. You give some of your money 
away to somebody that needs some, it purifies the rest of it. But it may, that's what Tazkiyah Bil Nafs comes, Tazkiyah, right? Bil Nafs, the purification of your Nafs. The only way we can get from where we are to where we need to go in the Muslim world is purification of Nafs. The cleaning, the cleaning of our Nafs. Zakah, Sadaka, all of that. That's what it, the, the root of that. Salah, all that means cleanliness, purification. I'm going to speed up here a minute. We have a policy of nonviolent resistance, but a policy of alternative resistance. The same policy we have had, returning good for evil, you know, even some of our main focus have been on opiates and white people's use of opiates, and we want to help them. That's one of our main projects. But guess what? Every project that we have, if we want to help the homeless, they come, the government come, and sell our property illegally. We'll get it all back. That's no problem. But we're not going to run out there, give me my property back because of the law. So we'll get out there. Everything we need to do, we'll do it. And everybody that is involved in that, we say that we love you. All of them. Everybody out there and everybody here, no matter what they do and no matter what they've done. Why? Because if you don't, <clears throat> You think about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he, in, in, in his case, he turned to love and kindness with the Quraysh and everybody. You know, when he came, when they took over Mecca, they said, oh Rasulullah, you come from a good family, you are an honorable man, what are you gonna do with us? He say, La Tatraba. I say the same thing to you that Joseph said to his brothers. No reproach. You see what I mean? That's what he said. That was his model of behavior. Now, if you broke one of Allah's ordinances, he couldn't do nothing about that. But if it was something against him, particularly, he forgave you. This is the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all the silly, I'm not even going to call them silly Negroes. Here's why. <clears throat> no, this is a recruitment tape, right? This is a recruitment. We won't spend much time on it, but we're inviting people to join and participate with us on helping America become America the good, not America the great. I know we even said this a lot, but we want America to be America the good, not America the great. That's gonna be a big job. You know why? They studied where we was coming from 50 years ago. And everything they've been doing, they've been doing it for 35 and 40 years. All this stuff, it ain't nothing new. Everything they have been doing to us now, we have survived all of that, but for what reason? Why have we as an individual, now I'm gonna use the thing about identity <clears throat> and the thing about the last recent period. We have articles that we wrote about mujaddid. <clears throat> a mujaddid is one that practices tajdeed. Tajdeed is purification, is cleanliness. Tajdeed. You know, jadid in Arabic just means new. Uh, a mujaddid is a renewer, a reviver, a reformer. So, jadid 
means something that is new, something that is recent, right? And part of a, of tajdeed is renewal, reorganization, reform, renovation, restoration, reconditioning, rejuvenation, and regeneration. That's a part of renewal. That's a part of jadid. It, it means diligence also, seriousness, earnestness. In history, the, the hadith it says, it's reported that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah shall raise for its ummah at the head of every century a man who shall renew or revive for its, its religion. This is in Abu Dawood. The word that it uses in Arabic is mujaddid. Uh, Allah will raise at the head of every century, you know what, close to the head, a mujaddid. So there's groups of Muslims have always been waiting on a mujaddid or a reformer or a renewer. And uh, they might have thought uh, Muhammad Abdullah Hassan in Somalia. A lot of people think this is the mujaddid. Muhammad Ahmed of Sudan that killed Chinese Gordon over there in uh, Sudan. They might say, hey, this, is God, this is the mujaddid. He's here to revive, right? So the Muslims in each area, Shehu Uthman Danfurio in Nigeria, they said, that's the Mujaddid. You know, this is a word. It's kind of one that's expected to come to do a specific job at a specific time. I'm gonna <clears throat> pass on that word just for a few minutes, here's why because it's a deep word, but identity, if you've been raised a certain way and you could see what has that been pointing to, all of this. Sometimes a person have to overcome their own Negroism and coloredism to say, well, just think about it. Everything that that person is supposed to do, we've already done that. We're doing it right now. So you would have to ask yourself, what does that make? That's a big question because that's a big step. And I'm not, I'm talking about a complex mujaddid now, not the standard. Uh, remember here, we got the whole world we're dealing with. In America, uh, we're talking about uh, an environment where uh, we cooperate with the environment, right? So uh, we wouldn't be trying to institute an Islamic program in America because the people are not Muslims. That's one thing about establishing Islam, the people have got to be Muslims. Right? <laughs> right? So, but the influence, we always talk about influence, what? The direction of change. That means in America, we want to influence the direction of change. That's what we want to do. And in, in, in the Muslim countries, we might want to see what, to, uh, let's call it Islam light. Not, all the laws would be Islamic and everything, but it wouldn't be nobody standing on the corner like in Saudi Arabia beating you to make you pray, right? Everything would be according to Allah and his messenger, but it would be more time for our countries to evolve into true Islam. Imagine, you can't find one country you might find a couple that pretty close, but you go Africa, Middle East, who's practicing Islam? Who's practicing Islam according to the Sunnah Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Not rituals. Everybody, you hear the dawn in every Muslim country five times a day, no problem. 
but how many in their heart, how many in their social and political relations, how many kings are ruling over people who I can, one Muslim, the richest Muslim country in the Arab world, assault and kill and murder the people in the poor, their neighbor, who's the poorest country in the Muslim world. How is that possible? When your neighbor, Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said about Allah, I thought Allah was gonna keep reminding me about my neighbor until he was gonna make them part of the, my inherit, their inheritance. That's a Hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu thought, hey, if it's one or two more things Allah say on neighbor, if your neighbor is hungry, you got to add some water to your stew and stir it up real good and take it to him. If your neighbor, remember what we went through on, on when we uh, deal with hosting and all of that? People come visit you, you got to give them the best place. If it's one heater in the house and it's cold, you got to put the heater in there, right? A guest to all of that stuff. How many of the people do that? Okay, we're going to speed up a little bit. Uh, what's going on today? If what we said is true, which we believe is true when we talked about identity, what was going on in our environment, a, if that's true, B, it means that a lot of that stuff is manufactured. Manufactured. In other words, everything that's happened to us, we feel is manufactured by the system. A lot of things in the world that we see clearly, that's why if they say it's blacks dying by this coronavirus and Latinos, that means it might be heavy elements of population control. I know one thing, Iran started on March 15th, Ides of March, of course. They said, we ha they start having military drills and cleaning and all of that stuff because they said, we don't know whether this is an attack, a biological attack or what. See, over here, we hear one part of the news, but the rest of the world, hey, they thinking about something else. They say, oh, and I want you to think about America. If black people and Latinos, the two biggest minorities in America, right, wake up and realize that they on Front Street and America hates them and always hate them. It hate black people because they brought us over here to work as slaves. No problem. They stole, you know, 55% of one country, Mexico, was stolen. California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, all of that was El Mexico del Norte. That was Northern Mexico. And in the Mexican War, the Americans stole that from them. Why? Because of manifest destiny. The vision of America being a two ocean power. This, that. Right? They used to have a, a picture of a, a guy in a sombrero, a Mexican taking a snooze. This is supposed to be a lazy person. The most unlaziest person in America is Mexicans. The hardest working people in the United States, picking all of that fruit, every drop of that fruit we ate, we eat, Negroes won't do it anymore. You can't drag them out of the penitentiary to go have them pick. It's, they, they got all kind of uh, spray on the grapes, right? Negroes ain't gonna do that. About 40 something. No, it was 50, it was way more than 50 years ago. 
This is about 1962. There's a bus that come to Oakland and they people go out picking, as they call it. I was unemployed. So you give the bus driver $2. He takes you out. At that time, we was picking peas. He picked a basket full of peas. Not big basket full of peas was 13 cents. Shoot, I said, that's it for this. One day, I never went again. All of that work, the Mexicans were loading up. Loading up. Because they, it was okay. But for a Negro, why you think we left the South? We left Dixie down there working in that hot sun for nothing and chopping cotton and picking cotton and all of that. We, we didn't go to California for that. This is the point. If that stuff is true, which it is, then we have to look at this, the environmental situation as manufactured. A lot of stuff that's happening is manufactured. If there's, if blacks have been free for 160, 70 years, and they're still shooting us down like dogs, right? If the court system, right? If the court system, all the court systems are uh, anti-black, anti-Latino, anti-everything, like that, okay? All the games, Martin Luther King and all those people in the 60s, how long had they been long gone? They flew away like a bird. Why? Because the people were not diligent. See, organizations have a type of recovery in them. You hit them, you knock them down, they got organization. They put things back together, they come back with a plan. You look up 10 or 15 years later, they're back on their feet. But people that are unorganized, they mobilize to make change. Injustice, injustice, injustice. Then after they mobilize and they get some surface justice, they go back home and go to sleep. But the system that they was working against never sleep. So you look up and they got Baki case, they got this case, they got that case in the Supreme Court. You look up in 10 years, this is all. It's illegal. To, you're de de denying us our rights by having Negroes come here and you know, and da 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 da. And guess what? Eventually the court agrees with them. the environment, then we'll leave it at, a lot of it is manufactured. We can easily agree that when we see the environment we're living in is, but there's a lot of it that's, although it's true, it's a combination of manufactured and not so manufactured, you know what I mean? the period that we're going through right now, instead of going back to California last couple of months ago, is a small rewrite. That's what it is, it's called it a rewrite. Not in our overall plan, because remember, no matter what you say, we have been headed in the same direction for over 40 years. Same direction. The only thing is, is where do you put, what is the priority, you know, for right now? And where do you put that? In what order? Okay. One of the last things I wanted to say was identify and clarify identify what all of this means. 
and then clarify our position. That's all it is. So that's why we're here now instead of in California. And then Allah keeps arranging it. Oh, we're just working on the roof and da 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 just for a little while and then we're going to California and then Allah keep, pretty soon you look up and you say Allah kept us here for a reason. To be here during this recent period to identify our position in all of this, to identify how this affects the whole world Right? The, this is the biggest event in modern history of this century, for sure. This is what's going on now in the, in the world. We don't know whether it's totally manufactured by the system or partially manufactured. Partial manufacturing means that the system can set out something and then it gets out of hand. You see, a lot of things that they do, remember, they may think they're God, but they're not Allah. And they may have something that they got in store for me or you or others, and it gets out of hand. Even when their time, when the conclusion is coming, no matter what their plan was, remember, Allah says in Quran, they have a plan. They have a scheme. Pharaoh had a plan. All those empires had a scheme, a plan. But Allah is the best of planners. And this is what we, this is what we rest on. We don't have to have a perfect clarification. What we want to do is put things as much as humanly possible. But we don't want to violate the rule of tafweed. Remember, tafweed and tawakkul. We've been talking about this. Tawakkul and tafweed are very close. They both mean the trust in Allah. But we evolve to a level of, now this is what we're thinking, that we're using tafweed. <laughs> because in tawakkul, you make your plan and you do go through these processes, then husband Allah, that we trust in Allah and Allah is sufficient. Tafweed is like when Musa says, I entrust my affair to Allah. Afwida, tafweed. I trust my affair to Allah. That's what we're doing now. So we're not sitting here studying up, well, I'm going back to California next week. We don't have no, we, we're cruising. Why? Because Allah is in charge and we entrust our affair to Allah. And I'll close with this. It ain't no way in the world. Nobody could have lasted 50 years fighting boss man and, and, and it not be Allah got him covered. Why? Because ain't nobody else did it. Nobody else, I don't, if you find somebody, I just want their name, I want to go visit them and not shake their hand, but just say, it's nice to know you. I want to find them and I want to see the person or the people or the group or the organization that have faced boss man face to face, let's say 40 years, leave off the other, 40 years, four decades. And a lot and pulled them through so many, <laughs> i just tell you one, you know, I think it was back in 84, uh, I was going to sleep and then I kept picking up on funny stuff in the environment. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is. At the same time, you can read this in history, the Russian embassy, I mean the Russians, had built in microwave apparatuses in the U.S. embassy in 
uh, Moscow and was making all the Americans sick. So I said, this is funny. So I just did something. I turned the radio on and I left it on all night and all that went away. That was in 1984. That's why if you ask anybody to come into a house or the masjid, the radio was always on. It's just an old habit. But the radio in those days, you could, at nighttime, you'd pick up BBC, you'd pick up all the world news. All the news that was real, it would come on late at night. But it wouldn't, in the morning news over here, you wouldn't get that. But all the news that was genuine, or even close to real, all the lectures, all the talks, all the came on late at night. I developed the ability to listen to the news <coughs> and tell where they was going up until today. I mean, right now. Because you develop, uh, it's a long story. But anyway, this tough weed, entrusting our affairs to Allah, have been going on a long time. We're thankful to Allah. We know no one could get anywhere close to what we're doing, or no one would even have the desire. Oh, you got a car, you have a flat. After you have 50 flats, right, pretty soon you say, I'm walking, I ain't even going there, right? Or if they destroy your buildings that you build, right? And you say, I'm not going to do anything. I want more buildings. They try to condition you, right, to where you don't want to build and move and stand up anymore. That haven't worked with us. It haven't worked at all, and it ain't gonna work. It's just not gonna work. Okay, and I'll close with this. Identify and clarify. Identify the true situation what's manufactured and what's a combination of true and manufactured and figure out all of that and try to put ourselves into that. The last thing I'd like to say is when something happens, remember the rule. Who have a history of doing this before? Who have the ability, like if you look at it 9-11, who have the history of doing something like that? Why, well, it's the Zionists and the Americans. Who had the ability, only the Americans had the ability to close down the whole show. Nobody else had that ability. Who would gain? The Zionists and the Americans would gain. So, I thank you very much. Hakul Kaulihada. Wastafrullah li walakum. Are there any questions or anyone? Uh, yeah, someone did ask you, uh, someone kind of asked you your input talking about, you know, identifying things, things of that nature. They asked, uh, you know, is the Trump loop really applying herd immunity in America rather than seeking a cure for the virus? You know? uh, are they uh, looking for a cure? If you look at Donald Trump, if you thought just Donald, just Donald Trump, since they mentioned, you would think Donald Trump is pro-virus, pro, this, right? What did he tell everybody? The man is the biggest liar and forgetter. He lies so bad, it's just insane. So if you looked at him, he would be pro-virus. Why? He said last month, don't worry about a thing. This thing will be over in a week. It's going, it ain't no, and then everything that the doctors are sitting there telling them, I give them doctors a lot of credit because they, they sit, they have, they put up with it and they, I imagine that their consciousness is saying, we'll put up with this guy because if we're out, 
he'll just burn the whole place down. Right? He'll go around with a virus machine and spray it on everybody. Right? But then if you look at the, uh, the economy, they had six million people today sign up for unemployment. So that means there's 16.5 million people. But the stock market still went up. I realized that in 1987. In 1987, that was a stock market crash and then that was war in the Gulf between Iran and Iraq. And uh, when that war was over, I saw the stock market going up, up, up but I didn't see any production. Remember they were sending everything to Japan. Japan was getting big. Later on, everything was going to China, right? And so I said, man, how can the stock market go up, up, up without nothing being produced except the stock market where you could see a perfect Everything that's going on in the economy is false. When you study economics, the, the Fed can give away money, all the money they want. And it's not real. One of the scientific doctor so-and-so said the other day, he said, the only thing that's real is debt. No, just think about it. They make up that money, print it out. No big deal. They loan you the money. What you owe them is real. And let me say this again, because it took me a minute for it. The money is not real, but the debt is. That's why I all out we seek that refuge from anxiety and grief, lack of strength and laziness, cowardice and niggardliness, and debt and the oppression of men. Why do you think Reba, they said Reba runs you crazy. They've been ran crazy by Reba. Interest. The people that run this world are Reba orientated. The central banks around the world, if you think I'm jiving, when this is all over, watch and see who has all the money. Remember we talked about the concentration of wealth and the concentration of resources? If you got money, that's why the Quran says that what zakat is to prevent a circulation, is what the Quran, of your money amongst the rich. Remember the old saying, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. Okay. What America does is offer you a chance, at least they used to. You could come here and work, 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 and you work, 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 if you use the, the right goals. You can get up, you can touch the middle class. That's why all the immigrants, they come here and they look at blacks, they said, these people must be lazy. Why are they so lazy? When America is full of money. That's what all immigrants say that. Koreans, Arabs, everybody look at us and they, because they haven't been beaten down yet. They haven't been beaten down yet. They haven't had the whole system squashed. The system is here to the immigrant. He come, oh, you get rich friendly, you open chop suey joint, right? Oh, whatever it is. I watched the Vietnamese in California. They came, one house, it used to be 20 of them in a house. Then they'd buy another house. There'd be 10 in that house. Then they'd buy another house. 
And each time they spread out, they would own that house. And guess what? The Vietnamese start doing Negro nails. Why? Right? Why all the hair products places is owned by Koreans and everybody else? But Negroes buy all the products. Because we've had generation after generation of sabotage. And other people, when they come here, they already know what they're going to do when they get here. But no Negroes prepared to drive a cab for 16 hours a day. He's not, a par he's not prepared to drive a cab 16 hours a day. But if you come from Sudan and somewhere else, you'll do that happily. Or you'll drive it 12 hours a day, you give it to your brother, he drive it 12 hours, right? That's what they do. And then they buy a, 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 this joint and that joint, and pretty soon they're all in there. It's the same thing with Koreans, right? All immigrants lock in on something. So all the nail joints is uh, Vietnamese and other people, right? If you see yums and lums and all of that, they got, can you imagine, all the Negroes in D.C. come from the South and it ain't no greasy spoons hardly in D.C. It's all Chinese eating joints. And the Chinamans is cooking southern fried chicken for niggas. Excuse my language. Right? We don't own nothing. Right? It's not that we don't have discipline. Now, suppose you're a businessman, though. You know why the police do what they do with me personally? Because in Oakland, in 1968, you've heard me talk about East Oakland Enterprises? Well, East Oakland Enterprises, that's what it was. I was the first young black to get rich. I mean, big time rich. But you know what? My friends wasn't rich. And they was all looking at me like maybe I was something special and something like that. They was working on their jobs and all that. So guess what? East Oakland Enterprise, the, the first and only African-American economic inter enterprise zone in America that worked. Martin Luther King went to Chicago in 1968, but it didn't work. It was an economic enterprise zone in Oakland for five years, it was not only the Black Panther Party there. They was there jumping up and down. But we was getting rich, and we made everybody in the town rich. They used to call me the mayor of Oakland. Why? Because I hired more people than, all, than the government, than the city of Oakland. That's, that's what they called me. You can call Oakland right now and say, hey, man, it's Big Hank. They, 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 he, he, he was running Oakland economic enterprise zone. Guess what? When the police finished with the party, they let us go. You know why? They said, this nigga here is going to sell everybody this and it's going to kill off the whole community. We didn't do that. <laughs> we didn't fight each other. You go to LA, you go to any city, all the gangs and crews is fighting each other, right? Not in Oakland. Let's say, not in my town, not during my administration, no niggas was allowed to kill each other. The white man looked up in the early 70s and saw what was, he said, oh, he was trying to get rid of the Panthers and this nigga here is, uh, didn't change the whole city. So, that's why I had to leave the country, because it was a, you know, where you can feel like your time is up. So I was watching this thing happen, that thing happen. I said, I think the white man is mad at me. Yeah. So I just left. I just left. So in order to answer the question, 
nobody wants anybody to unify. I'm talking about Islam. Nobody wants wahda, unity amongst Muslims, right? All the stooges, whether it's Jordan, Saudi Arabia, whether it's the Emirat, Emiratis, all of them that's on the white man's side, they're all pro-Zionist Arabs. And then you take any of the other Muslims, they have Saudi Arabia and those other ones mad at the other Muslims and subverting what they want to do. So you'll have Saudi Arabia subverting Iraq. When Saddam was there, Saudi Arabia was helping Iraq. Egypt was helping Iraq. All of them, see, this is the reason we used to have Wahda programs all the time, unity programs all over America, because we used to have a saying, La Sharqiyya, La Garbiya. Neither East nor West. Islam is the West. Right? I'm trying to tell you. And that's why. The Zionists, we don't get no break from nobody. We already telegraphed where we was gonna go over 40 years ago, and he says, we don't want them to go there. We don't want that to be a success. You know what? Bump them people in the behind. If they have been working on us full schedule for 40 years, and we're still here, hey, bump them in they behind. We're doing all right. And it, it couldn't be done unless Allah is our protector. It can't be done. The Negro ain't smart enough, ain't big. You can't protect yourself from like the Quran talked about enemies you know and you don't know. Can you imagine the amount of Zionist enemies we have? The Zionists put it in all the papers. Who they hate? We hate Imam Musa. That's the Israelis. That's the Zionists. Okay? Therefore, it's not just the Americans, which are kind of slow. It's the Zionists. They know if the Muslims ever unify, they'll just take a buck, each Muslim will take a bucket of water pour it on Israel and wash it into the Mediterranean. Simple as that. Okay. Was there any more questions or comments? No, that was... Uh, no, that's it. Okay. How's the, uh, the number of people, is it picking up? Or? It's picked up a lot since, you know, the COVID-19 virus. Um, I guess, you know, when it came, we thought, you know, man, our Savior is consistent. Right. No doubt about it. Hey. So, you know, the numbers have gone up. Yeah, very good. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. I should do an la ilaha. Astaghfirullah katubu alayhi. Abdullah. Okay.